Right guys, let's make a start. Let's crack on and uh, folks can just grab a seat as they come in. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew 10, so on the Bibles, page 975. Um, that's what we're going to be looking at together. Uh, just to kind of update maybe what's happening over the next few weeks in the run-up to Christmas. Uh, the plan is, um, not next Sunday, but the su- what's the date next Sunday? Do you know the date? Sixth. So it's the 13th of December. Yeah, that's the Sunday after that. 13th of December. The plan is that we're going to have a carol service type thing here. Um, now, that, now, it won't be like the carol service that we had last year in the community centre because obviously we can't have that many people. Um, and also, actually, we're not allowed to sing any songs. Um, so it's going to be a, well we're going to watch people sing songs so how great is that going to be uh, no you can maybe hum with your mask on um, uh, <laughs> um, so the plan is on the 13th and on the 20th of December we're going to have carol services now next week you're going to have to sign up for that because um, obviously we can't have everyone in here um, for that. Uh, it'll still be good, it'll still be f- festive, it'll be making the best of a bad situation. Um, and then on the 25th of December, which is Christmas obviously, um, what the plan is, we're going to have a meal in here for people that have nowhere to go at Christmas time or you know they don't have um, anyone at Christmas time, we're going to have a meal for them on the 25th of December and so that'll be a sign up as well. We'll have a sign up sheet throughout the week for guys that come into the church throughout the week and then we'll have a sign up sheet on Sundays as well. Um, so next Sunday um, we'll bring the sign up sheet, we'll bring some publicity about the stuff that we're doing over Christmas. It's not ideal, it's not going to be as fun, well no it'll be good. Um, it maybe won't be as fun as the carol service last year but it'll still be good. That was great last year. Ah, that was good. Yeah. Right, um, so let's make a start, let's start our service then. We're going to begin um, by praying. So uh, we're going to pray for our service. Uh, We usually like to pray for um, a country as well. And we're going to pray today for um, the country of Libya. Um, You might not know where that is. It's in North uh, Africa. We're going to pray for the church in that country. Um, It's a very hard place to live as a Christian. It's about the same size as Scotland in terms of population, 6 million um, and you've got roughly 2% of the population, um, or sorry, 0.3% of the population would be evangelical Christians. Um, it's a place where uh, if you're caught planting a church or reading the Bible, then you would be severely persecuted by the state. Um, it's a place in which it's very hard to get the gospel to it. Um, there's, they don't have any Bible translation in their own language, Libyan Arabic. Um, and so we really want to pray Um, that the gospel would reach that nation and that people would be saved. I want to pray for the church there that are suffering. Um, If you had a list of like countries where Christians are persecuted most, I think the number one is North Korea um, and Libya would be number four. Um, So it's it's a very difficult place to live as a Christian. So I'm going to pray for that nation uh, just as we begin. Father, thank you that we can gather together to study your word. Thank you, Father, that you speak to us, that you care for us, that you love us. Thank you, Jesus, for the promise that the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. And Father, we want to pray for your church now in the nation of Libya. Um, Father, we pray and we ask that, um, that they would have a Bible in their own language. Pray, we pray, Father, that that work would start so that many Libyans can read and hear the gospel in their native tongue. Father, we thank you for opportunities to present the gospel through radio and through the internet and through TV. And Father, we pray that you would work through that to bring people to Jesus. Father, we pray for the small number of Christians um, that meet in that country, for the churches that gather underground for fear of persecution from the state. And we ask, Almighty God, that you would strengthen and encourage them and embolden them to speak for Jesus. Lord, they could lose their lives just by talking about you. And so we are grateful for their witness. And we pray, Father, that you would overcome the opposition, the persecution, and that your church would grow in that nation. Please, would many souls be saved and would they come to know you? Father, we pray for ourselves. I'm just thinking about Christmas coming up and all the restrictions and stuff in place. 
Father, this is a dark time for many, a lonely time of year for many. Um, pray, Father, you'd help us to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens. And ultimately, Lord, we pray that we would shine the light of the gospel uh, in the darkness, that people would embrace the hope and the freedom and the joy that can be found in Jesus. Um, Father, please would you bless the carol services that are coming up. Uh, and Father, please would you touch many hearts and change many lives. Uh, and would Jesus be exalted, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you've got a Bible, page 975, um, page 975, Matthew chapter 10. Um, doing a series going through Matthew, Matthew 8, 9 and 10. Um, working our way through these chapters. It's page 975. We're going to be reading from verse um, 16 to verse 33. It's kind of weird. It's like in the middle of the chapter. The big numbers are chapters. The little numbers are verses. We're going to be reading chapter 10, verse 33. Um, just kind of update you, well, fill you in if you've not been here and what this is about. Um, in Matthew's Gospel, in this section that we've looked at, um, Matthew's recorded for us these amazing miracles that Jesus has done, really to prove one point, that Jesus is God's king and therefore Jesus has all the authority of heaven and earth. And that's good news because uh, as Matthew makes clear, that means that Jesus alone has the authority to undo everything that is wrong with us and everything that is wrong with this world. And so um, after that kind of display of authority from his miracles, Jesus gets his 12 disciples together and he wants to send them out first to the nation of Israel and tell people this good news, that the king has arrived, God's savior for the world has come. And so in chapter 10, this is like him, him getting his disciples prepped to go out and to do mission, to go out and tell Israel and then the world about him. And there's one thing I guess he wants to make clear in this chapter. Uh, talking about him is the most important thing you'll ever do. And talking about him is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Jesus wants his disciples and he wants us today to get real about the fact that if we want to live for Jesus and if we want to speak for Jesus, uh, it's going to be brutal. We're going to face some stiff opposition. So um, let's, let's read it then. Let's read what he has to say. Um, Chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus says this to his disciples. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish um, going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Right, um, again, another bit tricky passage. Um, 
let me pray. We're going to look at this again. If you've got like questions and stuff that are coming up off the back of it, um, after we've looked at it, please do ask the questions at the end and um, we'll work through this together. So let me pray first and then we'll look at this Bible passage. Father, we just ask simply that you would speak to us from your word. Father, we want to be challenged in areas that we need to be challenged in. We want to be comforted in areas that we need to be comforted in. Please, Father, would you help us see why it's so important to talk about Jesus and help us not to be afraid, but to trust him in all things. We pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, um, our, our purpose as a church is to tell people about Jesus, right? That's the main reason we're here. And um, we want to help people, but the best way that we can help people is by telling them about Jesus. We want to tell Charleston about Jesus. We're here for the folks in Charleston, for the people of Charleston. We love this scheme and we want them to know Jesus because Jesus, we believe, is the only way that we can be saved from our sins, right? That's the biggest problem we all face. We are sinners, all of us. Uh, all of us here are messed up. All of us here have mucked up. Uh, nobody here's got it sorted. We need a savior. And Jesus is that savior. He, he's, the, he's the only one who can save us. He has come to bring us back to God, uh, not just forgive us, he's come to adopt us into God's family so that we can be with him forever. That's, that's good news, right? Now, what do you do if you get good news normally? What would you do? Celebrate. Yeah, celebrate and you tell people right you what you get good news the first thing you want to do is share it with people and so that's what Jesus wants his disciples to do here's the thing though um, most good news when you tell people that they're kind of happy for you and they think that's great um, there's something about this good news that if you go out and tell people this some will think it's great some might not care but a lot of people will hate you for it a lot of people will not like this at all. And so when Jesus gets his disciples ready to go out and do mission, he wants them to understand that. He wants them to understand that this is going to be really difficult, but really worth it. So I want to look at this chapter. I just want to look at two, two things here um, under kind of two headings. First of all, I want us to see the difficulty of mission. Why it's difficult to live and to speak for Jesus. And then secondly, I want to... Well, Jesus wants to tell us why we don't need to be afraid. It really ends on a, um, a really encouraging note from the Lord Jesus. Um, I want to hear the tone of what Jesus is saying when he speaks these words to his disciples. He's not having a go at them. He's trying to help them. He's trying to encourage them. But he wants them to get real about how hard this is going to be. So, firstly then, let's look at the difficulty of mission. If you want to talk about Jesus, it's going to cost you. Let me just tell you about some folks that I know. A um, couple of lads I know started a church in a um, place called Balanark. It's a scheme in Glasgow. Um, they've been there now for, one of them's been there for about 10 years, I think, working on this. Um, when he started off, uh, he faced some pretty intense opposition from guys in the scheme. Uh, his house was egged uh, numerous times. Rumours. Uh, th they threw red onions at his house as well. I don't know what that's about. Um, he thinks they were trying to make an omelette. Um, <laughs> Rumours were spread about them as a church. Um, they even had folks kind of get together in the scheme and, and start a Facebook campaign against them. Um, all because they were wanting to tell people in Balanark about Jesus. Um, and hats off to them. They've persevered through it. And um, it's, it's great to see what's happening there just now. I've got another friend. Um, He's a minister like myself and one of his kids got bullied at school and uh, the surprising thing about it was that the bullying was not led by um, other kids, it was led by the teachers. Why? Because, well they didn't lead it but they encouraged it. Why? Because uh, this man, my minister friend, taught the Bible, made a stand to follow the Bible and the people in the school did not like that and spread rumours and as a result um, this guy's kid went through a rough time. Uh, I know another guy became a Christian out of a chaotic background. He, he was in the jail for a while, um, violent lifestyle, involved in years of drug abuse, gave his life to follow Jesus, started to change, um, working for Jesus now, doing amazing work for him. 
And his dad just couldn't handle the fact that he became a Christian. In fact, he said that his dad said to him, I would rather you were on the drugs than in that church. That's hard. Yeah. Now, that, there's honestly loads of examples I could give from small opposition like people making fun of you um, or embarrassing you uh, to more serious opposition like the 50 Christians that were executed in Mozambique at the start of this month because they were Christians. You won't see that on the news. But that is normal. And that is how the good news of Jesus spreads. Um, you realize this book that we have here, it came to us in our language through the shed blood of many faithful brothers and sisters who wanted to get this out to us so that we could read it in a language that we could understand. When you look at the history of the church, you see that more often than not, it grows and it spreads the gospel through opposition and through hardship. The Apostle Paul once said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And that's why when Jesus gets his disciples ready to go out on mission, this is how he describes it to them. He says, behold, I am sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. Um, now, I've never seen a sheep amongst the wolves, um, but do they have wolves in Camperdown? At the yeah. zoo? Yeah. Timber, timber yeah, well, we, I remember we took, um, we took Finlay to some farm place and, oh no, where am I thinking of? Oh, a, the deer centre, that was it. <laughs> it was the deer centre in Fife. And I remember they had this big wolf there and didn't see a sheep being thrown, but we, shot, we saw the guys throw this big slab of meat to the wolves and they just devoured it. So you can imagine this kind of image of, of a sheep surrounded by these pack of wolves well Jesus says that is what it's like to go out on mission that's what it's like to go out and to tell people about him it's brutal and Jesus wants us I think just to kind of understand just how, how difficult that is how hard it is so that we won't make it harder for ourselves so he goes on in verse 16 to say therefore I want you to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves now, there's a lot of animals in that one verse um, here's what he's saying. He's saying, speaking about me will be hard, so don't make it harder. Make sure, first of all, that you're shrewd. Does anyone know what shrewd means? Sly. 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 Yeah. 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 I can't read your lips because of all the masks. Um, it's like preaching to a bunch of ninjas. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, I wasn't sure if that's what you guys were saying. It's kind of, it means to be like, to be wise. You said, you said like sly. Jesus is saying, look, when you go out and talk about me, I want you to be wise like a snake. Um, which means, you know, go out, share the gospel, but you don't ram it down people's throats. You don't, you don't share it in such a way in which you're kind of looking for a fight, looking for opposition. You know, never compromise, never muddy the truth, but be wise in how you share that truth. Time it wisely, speak it wisely. And he says, be wise, be shrewd like a snake, but also be as innocent as a dove. Um, or we could say, be, be gentle. So don't be a bam when you're talking about Jesus. Be gentle and kind and humbly offer the good news of this salvation to people. If people slam you, let the only reason they slam you be because you're a Christian. Not because of the way that you've said something. Don't be angry. We don't be aggressive. We don't be careless in what we say. Um, Craig told me a quote from someone. I think it was from someone's mum. Um, I can't remember. Which says this. Don't add your own offence to the offence of the gospel. That's a good quote. Um, so Jesus says, look, it's going to be difficult. You're sheep amongst wolves. Be wise. Be gentle. But always remember it's going to be hard. Even if you're wise, even if you're gentle, you're still like a sheep amongst the wolves. And he wants his disciples to get real about the fact that when they go out, it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's not going to be an easy mission. When they go out, they're going to face some intense persecution. Um, so just quickly, I want you to see where they're going to face persecution from. And this is what happens all across the world. Now, we might not get it as intense as the 12 disciples got it, 
but certainly that opposition will be there. So they're going to face persecution, they're going to face opposition, first of all, from the religious leaders. Look at verse 17. Um, verse 17, be on your guard, you'll be handed over to local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. That was like the religious ruling bit of um, Israel at that time. Uh, it's interesting how often a lot of the good news of Jesus is opposed by people who would say they're Christians or by places that call themselves churches. Very common. Um, secondly, they're going to face opposition from political leaders. Verse 18, on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Now, in our country, um, you're not going to get lifted for speaking about Jesus. Not yet, anyway. Um, but like Libya, a country we were praying for, you certainly would um, face um, opposition from the political authorities. And then here's the final place of opposition. And in some ways, I think this is probably the most brutal and this is the one Jesus is going to talk a lot about next week. Um, they're going to face opposition from their family. See in verse 21. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, I hope you're feeling the weight of that. That's quite a lot of opposition, a lot of persecution. We were saying last week that when Jesus teaches the 12, he's really focused specifically on their mission to Israel. But it's clear now, he's talking about Gentiles and kings, that he's kind of had that narrow focus last week. It's clear now he's broadening it out to think about Christians everywhere throughout time across the world and the opposition that they will face. And the reality is that they do face opposition from these three areas. Jesus says, you will be hated by everyone. Now, is that just for them? Well, I, I think the principle's meant to be applied to all of us. Look at verse 24. He, he lays down a principle that applies to all his followers. The student is not above the teacher, nor the servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like the teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? Um, Beelzebul, um, you may have heard that from that Queen song, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, it's just another word for the devil, right? Jesus is saying, look, if they called him the devil, if they called Jesus the devil, right? And if they maligned Jesus, how much more are they going to do that to his followers? If people found a reason to crucify the Son of God who was perfect and flawless in every way, of course they're going to find reasons to oppose those who follow him who are imperfect and filled with flaws like us. So here's the point in all of that. Living, speaking for Jesus, is hard work. And if you do it, you will face opposition. Now, you might be tempted to think, well, not me. I reckon I could do it. I reckon I could still live for Jesus, still speak for Jesus and have people like me. To which I would say, do you think you are a better person than Jesus? A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. If they hated him, then they will hate you. If you think otherwise, then you think you're above him. Now, it might be that some of us are not facing opposition. Uh, that could be that God, you know, sometimes God blesses us with a time of peace. Um, it's really interesting when you read about the spread of the church in the book of Acts in the Bible. It's intense, some of the persecution they went through. But there's a period, Acts chapter 9, where it just says the church was blessed with a time of peace. For a little while. And then, as is the pattern in Acts, they suffered a wave of persecution and one of their church leaders uh, got executed. Now, some of us might be in that season of peace or mild opposition, praise God. But it could be, maybe more likely, we're not facing much opposition because we're not actually talking that much about Jesus. And we're not doing that because deep down we care what other people think about us. 
I mean, some of the opposition is going to come from our closest relationships. That is tough. That is really tough. Now, what happens, I think because it is so tough, what, 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 you, what I think you do see today is you get some churches that um, say they're churches, but they will not tell people the truth of the gospel. And the reason they won't tell people the whole truth of the gospel is because they want to be liked. And the gospel will not make you liked by everyone. So these churches do nice things, but they have not held out the offer of eternal salvation to lost souls. They do not warn of a real hell. They do not point people to a real savior. And as such, the people round about them are not hearing about a real hope. The truth is that any church that does do that does not love people. They love themselves and their reputation. Now, that's, that's not us. Um, that's kind of at the extreme end. But at the same time, we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that, that Jesus has called us to a comfortable life free from opposition. We're not called to have it easy. That's not what he's called us to. And we're not called to have people think that we're amazing and great. We're called to make disciples, to have our whole life built around a savior who was crucified and to tell others about him. And the truth is, Many, if not all of us, struggle to do that because we don't like opposition. We don't like people saying stuff about us. And I reckon if we were to take a survey and we were to ask kind of folks in the church today, why do, why do you not talk about Jesus? I reckon the answer that would come back nine times out of ten would be this. We're afraid. <laughs> we're afraid of what they might say to us. We're afraid of what they might do to us. And I think Jesus knows, he knows that that is going to be, that his disciples are going to be tempted to bottle it. Like this is so tough. And so what he does now is he gives them reasons not to be afraid, to keep going with this mission, not to be afraid in the face of opposition. So that's what, that's what I want to look at now. Three reasons why we don't need to fear and why we should tell people about Jesus and live for Jesus boldly. Let me tell you the first reason that he says. Jesus says, do not fear for truth will always prevail. So don't fear slander. Don't fear what people might say about you, even if it's not true, because at the end of the day, truth will always prevail. Have a look at verse 26. He says, do not be afraid of them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. I just want you to imagine for a second, right? Imagine Jesus had, hadn't said anything about how hard it is to, to follow him and to speak for him. Wouldn't you feel utterly discouraged when you tried to do that? And you were just met with opposition and hardship. One of um, the aspects of fear is encountering something that's unknown or unexpected. Um, I think this is part of the reason why I get freaked out um, whenever I go swimming in the sea. So I took the boys to, um, in just near the end of lockdown in the summertime, took the boys to Broughty Ferry Beach. And I was out in the water with Finlay and something brushed past my leg and I couldn't see it and it absolutely freaked me out. So I bolted out that water as quick as I could. Um, when you can't see things, something that's unexpected, it kind of freaks you out. Well, Jesus is telling us what to expect so that when it does happen to us, we're not thrown by it. When we face it, we can say, well, Jesus did tell me this would happen. It doesn't mean I've done something wrong. Actually, it might more often than not mean you're doing something right. So fear not, he says, because if they call you the devil, if they make fun of you, if they say stuff about you that is not true, don't be afraid because in the end, truth will prevail. What is concealed will be disclosed. What is hidden will be made known. The truth will always come out. Nothing false will stand and the real hidden reasons people have rejected him will be made known. Don't be afraid. God is the one who gets the last word. 
So what you hear whispered, proclaim it from the rooftops. Uh, it doesn't mean literally, it's an image, right? It doesn't mean literally get up on the rooftops with a megaphone and proclaim it for the whole scheme to hear. Uh, remember, we've got to be as wise as snake. But it's an image that gets across that we are to be unashamed in the gospel, fearless and telling it to people. Who cares what they say about us? The truth will come out. And what matters is, pe is people hearing it. What matters is that they hear what, what we have heard whispered from God's word and that we don't bottle it up, but we share it, we proclaim it, we're unashamed of it because these words are the words of eternal life. So don't be afraid. The truth will always prevail in the end. Second reason, Jesus says, don't fear men, fear God, right? It's not that fear is always a bad thing. Jesus wants to make sure we fear the right thing. Look at verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who could destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, see what Jesus is trying to do in this verse. He's trying to help us see the big picture. And at first, it doesn't actually sound that encouraging. Um, so, this is what he's saying. Don't be afraid. What's the worst they can do? They can only kill you. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Um, we're Scottish, so I reckon we'd say the worst they can do is embarrass us. But Jesus says, no, I just want you to think just now of the big picture. We are all eternal beings. And what's more terrifying, the person who can kill your body or the God who can cast both body and soul into hell? God is way more terrifying and what he can do is way more terrifying than what any human being can do. Don't fear man, fear God. Now, don't mishear this. He's not saying that we need to be afraid that God will cast us into hell. He's not saying to the disciples, you better do mission and you better be afraid because if you don't, God's going to cast you into hell. That is not what he's saying to them. If you follow Jesus, you never need to fear that. Jesus died for our sins so that we could have confidence that we would never face God's anger. All, all God's anger has gone on him rather than on us. So when he talks about fearing God, it means not fear of his judgment, but it means a respect and a reverence and an awe for who he is. It means understanding that, that the God who has called us to go out on this mission is not a God who is messed with. He is not tame. And you don't muck him around. And what should dictate how we live our lives is not fear of what people might say or do to us, but a fear of the state of their souls. We should be more afraid of the fact that they will have to stand before God the judge without a saviour. It's a different kind of, it's a, it's a selfless fear. And if we tell people that and they kill us, well, so be it. Jesus has our soul and we'll be with him in glory. Our lives are just a breath anyway. When we feel that fear of man, we need to think of the big picture, think of eternity. That's what is at stake. That's why our priority as a church is always to point you to Jesus to find salvation in him because we're talking about eternity here so don't be afraid of men fear God the book of Proverbs says that the fear of man is like a snare it's a trap it's something that will just imprison you for your whole life third reason not to be afraid do not fear for God your father cares for you verse 29 are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Now, this is interesting. If we are to not have fear when we talk about Jesus, we need to have a robust understanding of who God is, which means these two images that Jesus has that, that seem to kind of contradict each other. You've got to have both of them. The judge who can cast souls into hell is also the father who cares for sparrows. 
We've got to have both that, those images, both that understanding of who God is. And so if we are in Jesus, we can say with confidence, God is our Father. Now, I'm aware some of us will have uh, grown up not knowing what a good father is. So when Jesus says, think of God like a father, for many folks, for many folks around here, it conjures up maybe some negative images. But here's what we've got to see. No matter how bad or how good your upbringing might have been, if you want to understand what a loving father is like, don't look first to your own experience. Start with God first. And if you've not known the love of a father, then the good news of the gospel is that now you can. You can know the ultimate father and he values you highly because of what Jesus has done for you. So Jesus says, look, I want you to think about two sparrows. Um, at this time, like a sparrow was just an insignificant creature. Um, you could apparently buy two sparrows for a penny. Um, why you would want to buy two sparrows, I don't know. And yet Jesus says, God, your father, is in control of these tiny insignificant creatures, these sparrows. He's in control of them. He governs their life. He even determines when they will fall to the ground, when they will die. Therefore, if he is in charge and if he is caring for these insignificant creatures, how much more is he going to care for you? You are worth more to him than many sparrows. He knows everything about you. Look at verse 30. He, uh, verse 30 says, Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Um, that's the verse that every baldy preacher dreads to preach on. <laughs> this couch over here, eh? <laughs> <laughs> the point is, right, God, God your Father knows every single detail about you. He knows your fears. He knows your failures. He knows your sin. He knows everything about even the amount of hair that's on your head right now, God knows the exact number. He knows everything about you and he cares for you. God knows every pore in your body as well. Exactly. Every pore. every pore in your body, every molecule that you're made up of, he knows it all. And everything that is happening in this world, in his world, is under his control. Even the opposition we face, at the end of the day, is only ultimately used to serve his purpose. What that purpose is, we don't know, but, but he's in control of it. You know, I, um, I was thinking about this. Jesus, we talked about the compassion of Jesus two weeks ago when Jesus kind of talks about himself being a good shepherd. Do you not find it a bit odd that he is a good shepherd but he throws his sheep to wolves? Doesn't that seem like an odd thing for a good shepherd to do? Why would he do that? Answer. He is the kind of shepherd that wants more sheep to be brought into his tender care. And he is a good shepherd because he is the kind of shepherd that at the end of the day will always protect his sheep. Always. He protected us even up to the point that it cost him his own life. And at the end of the day, even if they kill you, no one can ever successfully take you out of his hands. He's got you and he does not let you go. And when we go out and speak, he is with us. He is helping us. He's upholding us. Verse 20 says that sometimes he even gives his Holy Spirit to us when we're up against the kosh. We are not alone. So go and tell family, friends, neighbours. Invite them here. Invite them to these carol services, whatever. Just conversations throughout the week with them just just tell them in a way that's wise and gentle the last two verses of this just to close are the i guess they're an encouragement to leave us on verse 33 and um, jesus speaks of those who have disowned him um and he talks about how he will disown them he's not referring to his followers who have struggled it it's not that one time that you bottled it and didn't share that status on Facebook or whatever, that, that's, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about those who hear the disciples' message persistently refuse to believe it and persistently refuse to acknowledge him. He disowns them. 
But the encouragement is in verse 32. Those who have acknowledged Jesus will be acknowledged by Jesus. And when you do eventually meet him, there will be no begrudging acceptance. No matter what you've done in life, no matter how many times you've mucked up, it's like Jesus presents you before God the Father and says, here they are, my brother, my sister. Look at how I've removed their sin so that they can be spotless in your eyes. Look at what they have done. And the Father will welcome you with such joy and say, as Jesus mentions elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Let me pray and we'll take some questions on this. Father, thank you for the encouragement of the Lord Jesus. It's hard to speak for you, Jesus. And we ask, please, that you would help us to do that, to live for you, to speak for you, to be unashamed. What we hear whispered on a Sunday or in a Bible study, help us to proclaim it from the rooftops. Help us, Father, to be faithful and to be <coughs> mindful of the big picture of eternity. Thank you for that great encouragement that because we have acknowledged Jesus, he will acknowledge us before the Father. Thank you that he is with us, that he cares for us, that he is a good shepherd, that he will protect us, and that he will see us home. And so help us to do what we can with the time that has been given to us. We pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Um, right. Any questions on that? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I know you are. Yeah. 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 Just be yourself and yeah. do it. And, and you, you know that, I guess, just referring to the, the first bit of what you were saying about the idea of our sins. What was that? So I didn't. I, I mean, didn't catch. If our sins are forgiven, right? And if yeah. you were saying, like, you're still not feeling that your sins are gone. Yeah. Know, once you become Christian. Yeah. No, but I, I think what, so sometimes, like, I, part of becoming a Christian actually has been more aware of how sinful you are. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 I agree with you. Um, and, and so sometimes it's quite, I agree, because sometimes people can just be too kind of beating themselves down about their sins and not actually accepting the fact that, yeah, you, you've got to, take it I, th I think part what, one of the things that God does in your life when he starts changing you is he makes you more conscious of your sin and you're right you can't just yeah but you can't you can't just you can't just dwell on that you've got to be aware of that and take that to Jesus so the more you realize how bad you are the more you'll be amazed about how much he loves you and that he's dealt with that and so I, I'm more conscious of it I take it to Jesus and the more you understand wow Jesus forgave forgives me when I'm just mess up all the time yeah. the more you get that the more it kind of motivates you to what, what you're saying as well you want to go and tell Solomon oh Sodom and Gomorrah yeah, that's yeah. Was no yeah there's they're, they're two cities Genesis 19 you can read about them Genesis 19 not a nice story no, I didn't, yeah 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 Hello. Yeah. So maybe you're dead scared of the wolves because they're all around about you and they're barking and they're snarling and everything. But maybe their mouths are shut like the lion. Yeah. So that they actually won't get you, although you think they're going to. Yeah. And at the time when you're going out as a sheep amongst wolves, you don't feel often that confident. No. But there will come a time at the end of time where all the wolves who have posed will see the truth and they will be silenced and they will say, even if they despair to say it, the sheep were right and we were wrong. Um, now, yeah, I th the image though, I think is, is just purely to, to convey um, how hard it is. And they can bite and they can hurt because Christians get hurt all the time. But the point is that ultimately, at the end of the day, it's never successful. Yeah, but you're 
can. You're still not going to die unless it's time for you to die. Yeah. So if a wolf does get you or a, a person that's takes nature, you. That's nature though, isn't it? Yeah. Or you're going to then and take it as food. Yeah. So that, yeah, so, we'll, yeah, don't read too much into the image, but the, the nature stuff thing is like, um, ev even these things that we just think, oh, that's just normal in nature, like sparrows dying. Um, Jesus is saying, actually, everything small and insignificant is in control by God, and, and he really cares about you um, more than anything else. So, so don't be afraid um, when all the circumstances seem to be going against you and people are against you. Don't be afraid. Um, yeah. Good. Any more questions? Great. Let's, um, right, if you want to go out and chat or have a cigarette or a vape, um, or if you want to sit, if you want, if you want a coffee, stay seated and try not to stand up too much unless you're going outside. Um, Yeah.